All right. So let's go. So my name is Ed. This is Rafael. And as Chris said, um, we've been building NewBank since day one, since the initial lines of code together. Um, our initial product is a credit card. So we started out as a credit card issuer in Brazil. Um, and we've expanded into being a, a full digital bank from there. Um, so just so you can get a sense for scale, we are uh, at about 2.6 million customers. And that is a lot when you consider the complexity of the domain model. There's a reason why core banking systems still run on mainframes in most places. It's a, it's a large domain. I'm going to try to illustrate that for you a little bit uh, to the extent I can. Um, but yeah, we have hundreds of millions of purchases, purchases coming from people visiting just about every country on earth. Um, but we're not a bank. We, 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 are selling financial, we are selling financial services, but uh, it feels like a tech company. We, we are a tech company. We deploy 20 times per day. We have 120 microservices. And we recently just crossed 100 uh, engineers on the team. So what we're going to talk through is, is really a credit to the whole team and all the engineers, the great engineers back in Sao Paulo and now Berlin. We, we started our second office. Hoffa and I are going to take credit for it, but it is really the work of everybody. Uh, briefly on our stack. So uh, we, we rewrote core banking and credit card processing from scratch. And so we used modern technology. Um, we love closure. Most of our production services use Clojure. It's a Lisp hosted on the JVM. And it's an opinionated functional language. It doesn't mean you can't write object-oriented patterns, but you know it when you're doing it. And so we, we really like that Clojure keeps us lean and keeps us focused on pure functions and, and helps us to scale. Um, we also use Datomic. This is the database that we use for most transactional workloads. The analogy that I would use is kind of like Git for your data. So you never lose anything. You a fact may be true and then later not true, but you never would do an update in place and lose that, that history. Um, we'll talk more about uh, some interesting properties of that. Uh, we're heavy users of Kafka. In fact, mo our default kind of service to service integration patterns are via Kafka. We really appreciate, similar to Datomic, that concept of an immutable log. Uh, and it helps us with logical and temporal uh, decoupling between services. And it's interesting, the financial services industry is legendary for ba big batch jobs. And we're starting to understand why. But one of the things that we do is we just treat batch jobs like a stream of messages over Kafka. And we can, we can almost model everything in banking as, a, as, as stream processing. And lastly, and this is kind of obvious, but we're cloud native. We, we architected everything on AWS from the beginning uh, about four years ago. And infrastructure is code. Um, we do blue-green blue deploys not only for new versions of services, but also for new versions of the entire architecture. So we'll go spin an entire new version of NewBank uh, and then kill the old version once we've rerouted DNS. So that's something that, that's helped us to avoid mutating uh, things in production and, and really helped us scale. And I guess just a, a last thing on the intro, we've seen a number of benefits from taking a functional programming philosophy uh, quite seriously from the beginning of the company. And, and I guess I would highlight three things. On hiring, counterintuitively, we see this as uh, self-selection, positive self-selection. People that have the courage to go out and try a technical exercise in a language they've never used before, certainly not in anger in production. Um, we find that that scares a lot of people, but the people that it doesn't are generally good people to hire. So that's helped us. Um, we've also seen now with over 100 services and millions of customers, uh, the complexity of the domain is under control. We have things that are difficult to deal with, but we always are able to untangle those things. And that's basically the architecture of a bunch of small, pure functions. Um, and consistency. Closure is a language that uh, encourages small number of idiomatic language features composing into big things. And so what we find is that it's easy for people to move between teams, and every service feels very, very similar. So it's, it's a fairly consistent architecture. Um, and this is our, our headquarters in Sao Paulo. So our initial architecture for credit card, and I'm going to lay out like a periodic table here that's going to make no sense. But the whole, the whole point is that it's, it's complex. Um, and, and this is the MVP. So in order to get a card passing in a machine, right, we had to build card origination, logistics, physical shipping. We had to build billing, payments, chargeback, a whole back office tooling, uh, et cetera. The next thing we built was how to go acquire customers, right? KYC, credit scoring, limit management. And this is an area where we heavily use machine learning 
this was the first place we put machine learning into production. After that, we started to take ourselves seriously as the system of record. So we rely on ourselves to know how much money you owe us. And that's where the general ledger system comes in, double entry, which we're going to touch on in more detail. Um, more, more recently, we decided to bring card authorization, transaction authorization completely in-house. So we built a MasterCard authorizer from scratch. Uh, we also built an ETL to make a mirrored analytical environment to optimize for, for different things. We'll talk about both of those. Um, we recently launched rewards. And very recently, we just launched a bank account. So this, this is not the traditional path, but we kind of came from credit card and went to core banking. And so the key features here are things like earning money on your savings, but also being able to use that same account like a checking account for instant peer-to-peer -peer transfers and stuff. And right now, by American standards, it's, it's, it's a good investment. We're, earning, we're paying 7% per year risk-free in Brazil. So um, it's, a good, it's a good place to put your money. So banking adds a few other components here, including real-time transfers, which we'll talk about from an architecture perspective. Um, and also, there's this point at the bottom, infrastructure. Infrastructure kind of glues everything together. And we'll talk a bit about uh, how, how that works at NewBank. So, so that's a lot of stuff. We can't cover all these modules, but we're going to cover the highlighted ones in some detail and hopefully go deep enough to give folks a, a real sense of, of how things work, starting with purchase authorization. OK, good morning, guys. Uh, so uh, I thought we'd start with maybe the most representative flow of our first product, and in many ways, our core product, the credit card. So let's talk about what happens when you make a purchase. Uh, when you do that, you actually set in motion a whole set of participants of the payments chain. So you're interacting with a merchant, and but the POS terminal, the point of sale terminal where you swipe your card, is usually managed by another company, a credit card acquirer. The acquirer is the company that maintains the relationship with the merchants, connects merchants to the broader uh, payments chain. The acquirer then will forward that transaction authorization message to the credit card network or brand. Uh, we are using MasterCard, other networks are household names, Visa, American Express, etc. And then the brand will finally uh, send that transaction authorization request to us, to an issuer on the other end. And that's our role as, as a payments institution. We are an issuer. This means that we maintain the relationship with the cardholder. The actual final customer is a new bank customer. And uh, as part of that, an important part for uh, talking about transaction authorization is that we take credit risk for that customer. If the customer fails to make due on his payments, uh, we earn the hook for, for that amount. So that's why we have the final saying on whether uh, a transaction was authorized or declined. Now, technically, how does that work? Uh, uh, on a data center that we control, the credit card network will place several devices connecting to their worldwide network. Uh, and one of our servers will run a service we are calling an authorizer, which will connect to that uh, to uh, the brand devices. The, the specific device that we connect to, I'm calling it here the MasterCard interface device. It is an edge device that accepts uh, TCP connections. And once we connect, we start receiving authorization requests. Uh, a couple of interesting points to note here are that we are a network client, not a network server. This means that to achieve concurrency, to be able to handle the transactional uh, volumes that we, we must deal with, we need to multiplex that single network connection. And another observation is that when we first went live, when we first connected to the real live payments network, we started receiving authorization requests immediately which uh, is a bit odd since we hadn't issued any credit cards at that point for the, the authorizer. What was happening is that we were receiving attacks, attempted attacks, uh, uh, people either brute forcing credit card numbers or people uh, using uh, data from those large credit card breaches in the past to try to attack us. And uh, the payments ecosystem is constantly under attack, it's something you need to, to know about before you, you undertake these kinds of projects. So the protocol. The protocol uh, we use to connect to the brand interface device is the same protocol that flows throughout the entire payments chain. It's based on an international standard, ISO 8583, 
But uh, this is not a standard like HTTP or SMTP where you can just read the spec and build a compliant implementation. Uh, you still need a lot of specific information from MasterCard, from the brand. And we had to consult a lot of uh, documentation and for, from, from that brand to be able to build a compliant implementation. And, but sometimes that wasn't enough. Uh, at one point in the project, we needed to pass uh, an input to a signature verification algorithm. And the actual set of input fields was not specified anywhere. So one of our engineers had to build a tool to brute force all possible field com combinations to, to understand what we had to, to build. Uh, you can also see on this slide, uh, uh, we are featuring a hardware security module. That's a device that stores a primary key on, on secure hardware. And every other key that's used for, for the, the encryption parts of the protocol are derived from that primary key on the HSM. And one of the ways that we use the HSM is that when you do a chip transaction, that uh, microprocessor on the chip will generate a cryptogram, which is a, a small amount of, of data that flows through the network to our services, and we pass it through the, the HSM for, for validation. Uh, so uh, in the beginning, Edward was talking about closure, how much we love closure, and it's true. We really love it. And even for the authorized project, most of our code is in closure. But uh, we thought that for parsing that binary protocol, we could take advantage of a Scala library called Escodec, which is a binary parser combinator style library. And we could achieve a lot of things by building upon uh, Escodec. Uh, uh, it's easier to build a parser. It's composable. The type system helps to ensure that all the parts are fitting together. We get error detection. And uh, a cool thing is that it also makes it easier to evolve that parser over time. When we, we were doing one of our early tests, for instance, uh, we thought some of the, the fields were going to be encoded as ASCII, ASCII strings. But uh, it turns out uh, when we were doing the live tests, we figured out we were receiving EBCDIC encoded strings, you know, that old mainframe protocol. And to change that, we had to just change a couple of references in this parser tree. And we were able to, to complete the test live while it was in the running in the test window. So uh, this kind of library for, for uh, parsing binary protocols is, is something that, that was very helpful for us. And now, uh, Stepping back a little bit and talking broadly about the authorizer project, uh, there were two main requirements that drove many of our architectural decisions. Uh, one is the availability requirements. Uh, we, of course, on our cloud services, we take care to make that they are available. That we, we have observability measures. We have measures in place to, to bring back a service when it fails. But uh, when we are talking about a project like an authorizer, where our customer can be trying to make a purchase in a gas station at midnight with only our card in his pocket, it's very critical that uh, every single transaction goes through. So availability was critical. Second uh, requirement that is important to us was that we are building on physical infrastructure. Uh, as Edward mentioned at the beginning, uh, most of our experience has been on cloud services. Most, most of our services we are building upon uh, the Amazon public cloud, we take a lot of advantage from automation uh, that, that the public cloud affords us. And then we have to face the prospect of building something on physical servers. Bare metal, we of course had to build all of that automation ourselves. We couldn't uh, uh, just uh, do it manually for just this once. It doesn't, doesn't work like that. And when you put those two requirements together, we decided to try to build a minimal uh, structure, infrastructure within that, those, those physical data centers with composed of a small set of highly available services. They are redundant within the data, data center, and we have multiple live data centers accepting uh, uh, transaction requests. And, uh, and in addition to being minimal, the other important part is that it's isolated. We are able to authorize transactions that are coming in through the payments network only with this small set of services running on, on, on our physical uh, data centers. Uh, we don't need any cloud communication in order to authorize a transaction. That is important because we are worried that if uh, uh, one of the links, uh, links goes down or if there's a problem with Amazon, this could affect av availability. Uh, and and the, the other thing to note here is that uh, we are using Thrift and Finagle for inter-service communication. 
And uh, so I was making this point about how isolated the, the inner loop for transaction authorization was, but some communication is required. Uh, the ultimate truth about data for all of our customers lies on our cloud services. Uh, they maintain their databases that are the ultimate owners of that information. And so there's, they need to know when a transaction is authorized. At the same time, there's information that we only learn about on the cloud side. For instance, if a customer makes a payment and that uh, entails a change in his credit limit, it's his available limit, we need to send that information back to the authorizer. And we are do, using Kafka for that. Uh, Kafka, as, as was mentioned before, is our default inter-service communication technology. And the cool thing of using Kafka for this project is that we are not using it only for communication. Uh, one interesting property that Kafka has that other message brokers usually don't is that messages are durable. A message does not disappear immediately after it's consumed. And we are using that to build a log snapshot style data platform on the authorizer uh, project. And we're doing that because we did not want to have a database running on our physical infrastructure as part of those, those requirements of being minimal and being, and, and being highly available. So we're storing everything in memory. The data that you need to authorize a credit card transaction is not very extensive. So uh, it's, it can be safely stored in memory in the authorizer services. But to be able to bootstrap that mean memory state and to ensure that every single authorizer replica is consistent, we piggybacked upon a Kafka's log. So the way this works is there's an Amazon service, it's running, it publishes a message. That message is consumed by our authorizer in our physical infrastructure. Everything's pretty simple so far. At the same time, a second service is also consuming those messages. This snapshotter service will consume those messages, accumulate an in-memory state, and periodically it generates a snapshot to disk and to S3. And when a new authorizer instance starts, let's say we're deploying a new version, uh, that authorizer instance fetches that snapshot from disk, loads it into memory, and now it's able to, to accept uh, new, new transaction authorization requests. It also fetches from that snapshot the offset on the Kafka log at which that snapshot was generated. So it can start to consume new messages, thus ensuring we don't lose any, any data. Uh, this here are just some, some metrics that we keep track of, and, and you can see how we improved our standing rate. That's the, the rate, that's the percent of transactions that we cannot authorize and the brand has to authorize, the network has to authorize on our behalf. We want to minimize that, and after we deployed our own authorizer, we, was, we were able to go down from uh, around 1% of standings to below one basis point. And perhaps with this slide, the thing that I most want to convey to you was a point about the process. Uh, with this project, we decided that we wanted to go live as soon as possible to, con to pass all of the MasterCard tests as soon as possible so we could learn from real data using controlled experiments, using co a controlled set of, of test cards. Of learn what actually was coming in through the wire in the real life, because uh, the, the, we knew that documentation couldn't be relied upon for a complete implementation. And, and that was very helpful for us. After those test cards, we rolled out a larger and larger sets of cards until we were able to, to uh, move all of our customer base to the authorizer. And next up, Ed's going to talk about accounting. Yeah, the <clears throat> wonderful job of teaching everyone accounting this morning, which I'm sure you're excited about. I'll try to do this efficiently. Um, so one problem that we face is that in the example that Hoffa gave on authorization, in order to say yes or no to a, to a given purchase, you don't need a lot of data, but the data you need depends on a lot of other data. So we need to know if you have an available limit. That is a cumulative function of everything we know about you for your entire history purchases, payments, credit limit changes, all that stuff has to come together to give us the answer, which is what's your open to buy, right? What's your available limit? So one thing that we do to manage this complexity is uh, we actually treat a lot of the core financial logic and the stateful uh, cumulative functions in a service we call double entry. 
So the model is pretty simple. It's an, an entry has an amount and then a pair of book accounts or ledger accounts, um, the credit account and the debit account. And then the balance at any given time is a cumulative function over all of the debits and credits for that book account, um, a cumulative sum. And a customer's balance sheet by extension is just the collective uh, picture of all their book accounts. And so what we've done that's different than what most people do is we modeled the double entry accounting system as an operational system. This isn't an analytical system that happens periodically with finance. This is in real time per customer. And we're relating business events like a new purchase or a new payment to a series of entries uh, that map to our domain model. So this is our, our mapping between a business event and debits and credits, right? Um, and collectively, we call that a movement. Um, this is an example movement where you have two entries. You have uh, you know, the unsettled for a new transaction that comes in that hasn't settled yet, and the current limit. Um, so this system has been very powerful for us, and, and it's the best way we know to show you, the customer, what your balance sheet is. We have a limit bar in our app, and you need to know what, what's, your, what's your limit. Uh, what's your current bill, et cetera. And so we use double entry for this. Um, but there are some challenges. For one, ordering matters. So uh, as an example, if you're late and you make a payment for more than you owe, you don't have a negative late balance. You have a prepaid balance, right? If those events happen in a different order, um, it, things would be different. Um, and to make this even worse, you have late arriving events. So you can make a payment we received today that should be credited on Friday, right? So what we need to do is time travel back and replay those events and try to figure out what's the right balance that doesn't violate our invariance that we have. Um, and, th and that's a process we call fixing invariance. So th this is an example of a generative test or a property-based test that we use. Uh, and given that the interleaving of events creates a combinatorial explosion, like it's, you can't write traditional unit tests that are gonna capture the entire space for something like this. So we, we create a randomized initial state with randomized adjustments and purchases, et cetera. And then we create a, a loss event and generate thousands of examples of this. And every time we verify that our invariance, the, the properties still hold. And, and this has allowed us to catch very real bugs in production. Um, the last uh, problem here is something that Hoffa is going to talk about next, which is write throughput. So this is where we start to hit the limits of what we can write through a single database. And double entry is typically our highest pressure database because most business events actually do generate debits and credits for new banks. So you have writes from basically any system in the entire architecture also causing writes on, on the double entry system. Um, so the next, the next item is infrastructure. We're going to talk about how we dealt with that problem among, among others. Thanks. Uh, okay, so we began this talk by showing you guys this curve. This is our customer growth curve. And we are very happy with that. Uh, it, it's good to have uh, customers and ever more number of customers. But as engineers, we need to, to look at that with skepticism. Uh, and, and with scale comes uh, scalability problems. And of course, we are no exception. The first couple of bottlenecks that started to affect our us initially were the database throughput problem that Edward was, was talking about. Uh, we are using Datomic, and it's a great database. But when we reach very high uh, write throughput levels, uh, we, we, we reach certain limits. We had to actually throttle message consumption that led to those writes in order to, to maintain service stability initially. Uh, another bottleneck uh, that, that, that uh, reared up its head in, in our infrastructure was the batch jobs. Some batch jobs that used to take just a few minutes were now taking many, many hours, even more than one day. And that, as you can imagine, can have a pretty serious impact for our customers. And uh, so the first thing to do when you, you're at scale, you try to optimize. And we try to optimize a few of our core flows so they are faster. But that has a limit. At some point, you need to find a way to partition your workload so you can safely uh, handle that workload in parallel and, and in an isolated manner. And, and we had to do that. And one interesting property of our domain that was helpful in that is that the interactions between customers are minimal. And that's different from other domains. For instance, uh, we look at social networks. Uh, 
in our case, most of the into, of the data and the business logic uh, that we run uh, pertains to customers at a time. So we could uh, use a partitioning of our customer base as a proxy for partitioning the workload. And the first option that we considered when we were thinking about how to partition uh, our, uh, our workloads to, to, to scale is to partition at the database level. So here you have a backend service and it, it used to write to a single database. It reached certain limits. We would then partition that database. So it have database shards. That, that, that service uh, on every write and on every query would need to route that write or query to the correct database. And that can work. Uh, a lot of companies uh, do that. But uh, we saw some problems with this approach. One is that it would take uh, an enormous effort to go through every service that was facing scalability problems and uh, update every single query, update every single transaction. And the, the quality of the code base after we changed all services to, to route to multiple databases might deteriorate a bit. And, but that's not the, the main problem. The main problem uh, in, our, in our eyes is that uh, this, when you partition the database, we are only addressing uh, scalability problems with the database. And there can be other scalability problems. Uh, we can have uh, long running batch jobs. You can have uh, the operational overhead of scaling our Kafka clusters. There's a lot of problems that this option would not uh, address. So we considered a, a different model, the scalability units model. Uh, when you're doing scalability units, your shards are not database shards. Your shards are actually copies of your infrastructure. So let's look at new banks infrastructure. We have our 120 plus services living on the cloud, their databases, uh, Kafka clusters, Zookeeper clusters, uh, networking. So when we go the scalability units model, we may build clones of that entire infrastructure, and we assign different uh, partitions of our customer base to different clones. Those are our shards. And that's what we ended up doing. It did really help. Uh, we can address multiple scalability bottlenecks at the same time. But of course, some routing has to happen. Uh, when an external event happens, uh, we need to be able to route those external events to the right shard. So on the transaction authorization use case that, that we were just talking about, a customer makes a purchase. Uh, this is run on our physical infrastructure. Our cloud has to know about that purchase and has to, it has to be routed to the right shard. So we build a section of infrastructure. We call it global. And the global section is not sharded. And the services that live on the global section, they are there mostly to, to maintain mappings from externally known identifiers to customer IDs and their shards. Uh, so when a purchase comes in, we look up certain identify information, find its shard, route it there. Uh, basically, the same kind of thing happens when we know about deposits, payments, other, other events. Uh, uh, there's a slightly different use case for interactive, interactive use. Uh, when our customers are interacting with uh, the app to talk to our services, uh, we are able to route that kind of, of, of flow only at the very beginning when the customer logs in. The way this happens, uh, you're looking at here at uh, customer logging in. The, there's a global service that will validate that customer's credentials. It will ensure that, it's a, it, that, that person is who she says she is. Then it will respond, if it's correct, it will respond to the app with hyperlinks, with hypermedia uh, links, where that app will, will be able to fetch more information. So here, uh, the app will fetch information about the account from a different service. This next interaction is already di directly uh, connected to the shard where that customer lives. And uh, new, new links from further communication between that app and our services then all, all flown through uh, a series of hyperlinks. And therefore, we can ensure that uh, that app talks to the correct chart at, the, at all times. And we don't need to build uh, an enormous uh, routing layer that would intercept every single uh, uh, 
request from the outside. We are able to do that only at the beginning, at that login, which is helpful, of course, for, for managing our load. Um, some, just going through some lessons learned uh, from this process. The first lesson, it's maybe obvious, it, it, it is working for us, and we are much less concerned about the impact of the growth of our customer base on our uh, production services, our production quality. But uh, there are some caveats. One is that this, if you go the scalability in its route versus uh, sharding each database route, uh, it's much harder to roll out incrementally. You basically have to be able to route, know how to route every single externally incoming event to the right shard before you're able to send even a single customer to a second shard. This means that it's a long project that only bears fruit at the end, and it's important to pay attention to how your customer base is growing while that project is, is underway. And uh, another point regarding infrastructure I want to make here is that even if you have a solution in place to deal with scale, problems happen. Uh, if you, services might try to interact with third-party providers that are offline, services might run out of memory, uh, a bug might be introduced, and services might start throwing exceptions. And uh, we uh, apply a couple of, of, of uh, highly interesting fault tolerance patterns to address those, those problems. I'm first going to talk about uh, dead letters. It's a very simple pattern, but it, it has produced enormous gains for, for our operations. Uh, message is produced, it, it is consumed, and at which point an exception happens, something bad happened. Uh, what we do then are our libraries that handle the message infrastructure will actually forward that original message along with some extra metadata about the error to a dead letter topic. Another service consumes from that dead letter topic and merely stores it in a data, database somewhere. Then offline, an engineer will triage those errors, those dead letters, on that, via that service. We've called it mortician for obvious reasons. And if uh, that engineer is confident that the bug was fixed and that uh, the, the problem healed, he can just republish that message back to the original topic. And that helps us because uh, uh, if you're a financial institution, data loss is, is the worst thing that can happen. So we can recover from possible data loss, eventual data loss in using dead letters. Uh, another pattern I'm going to talk about, circuit breakers. I'm sure most of you are already familiar. It's a very uh, common pattern if you're doing microservices. And, but the interest, interesting thing is how uh, circuit breakers interact with messaging. And so here we are consuming messages. Uh, an outbound call fails. If that happens enough times, a circuit breaker will trip. What we do then is we pause the consumer. We stop consuming messages. That allows uh, what could be a barrage of exceptions of events happening to become simply a lag that accumulates on a Kafka topic. And when the problem is fixed, we just start consuming it again. And One other thing that didn't scale so well is using Datomic and our operational transactional infrastructure for aggregations. Even simple questions like, how many customers do we have? I think our CEO asked me this many times, and it became increasingly difficult to answer. And that's, it's a simple question, what's going on? And the answer is, even especially with sharding and, and fragmenting the, the operational system so that they scale better, you're making analysis harder, and you're making an aggregates and analytical work harder. And so what we did is the traditional, I guess, approach of making an ETL, uh, which stands for Extract, Transform, and Load. So before we get into the ETL, uh, I just want to give a quick primer on how Datomic works. Two slides. Um, it basically works mapping business events to get commit style uh, transactions in the database. So if we think about a customer joining new bank and then getting a credit limit, making a purchase, getting a credit limit increase, blocking a card, right? So this is a very common sequence of events for our business. This is how they look in a Datomic database, right? So you have assertions of facts. This is a fact. This is a fact. And sometimes, like in the case of the limit changing, um, you have something that used to be a fact which is no longer a fact. It's no longer 3,000, it's 5,000. That's the limit. Um, and the other thing to notice is here on the, on the right-hand side, you have a monotonically increasing transaction because the transactions in Datomic are a first-class citizen. And you can use those to great effect when you're, when you're dealing with kind of log tailing, right? So for our ETL, what we have is an always-on log tailer that 
tails all of the datomic logs we have and then pipes them into our data lake, uh, doing chunking and format conversion and things like that. Um, and interestingly, it's the same thing that we do for certain Kafka topics, whereby the data is relevant and, and it's not in Datomic, right? Similar log abstraction, we, we consume from those topics and we load those things into our data lake. And from there, what we can do is we can paper over things like sharding, right? Like an analyst never wants to know, never wants to have to think about where the data is. Oh, is that in shard one or shard two or shard three? No. So we, we, we kind of put that back together into something we call a contract. So a contract is basically reconstructing a single logical table uh, for an entity. And then we build as functions of contracts and other data sets, we build a, a directed acyclic graph of data sets, uh, machine learning models, and also policies that translate uh, machine learning model scores into business decisions. Uh, an example would be translating a risk score into a credit limit uh, for you to, to do proactive limit increases. Um, and this is an example uh, from, from our business where this is really valuable uh, to have in the analytical environment. Uh, the green line is an example of revenue, and that comes directly from double entry, the operational system we talked about. Um, but the, the purple line is from our ERP, that's cost, right? That's not a real-time system, and that's never going to be in production in a real-time environment. But in the analytical environment, we, we can recombine those things to get the answer of, you know, are we making money? Our business is quite complex. It's not clear if you're making money on every customer all the time. So having every tool you can to understand contribution margin per customer per day uh, actually makes analytics much easier. Um, this is also the environment whereby we generate reports for regulators to keep regulators informed and happy. And that's something that makes our business complex, but it doesn't hurt us that much because we have very good tooling to, to make that happen. Um, it's also a great place to run machine learning models without having all of the constraints of production. Um, and last but not least, I uh, wanted to talk about something really recent that we launched, which is real-time transfers. Um, these are uh, screenshots of an app. So the, the concept of the product is you scan someone's QR code or otherwise get their, their bank account, put in how much money you want to transfer, and the money's there in real time, right? So it's very simple. Um, the way this works is the transfer request comes in, um, but as I said, you're earning 7% per year. This money is invested, right? So what we do instead of the traditional, there's no database transaction here, right? Because people are in different shards. So any form of kind of in the database transactional semantics are, are not gonna work. Um, but also we, uh, we need to liquidate your investment. We need to make sure that that money, that you have the money and that it's ready to, to be transferred. Um, so we do that and, and only then do we initiate a transfer out, right? And if this transfer out for whatever reason doesn't work, we'll do a compensating transaction, reinvest the money and, and kind of roll it back uh, because that's a very rare event. And we wanted to optimize for the most scalable way to run this. So we're, we're kind of real-time gross settlement of transfers here. Um, and at that point, we have a global service that consumes from every shard to get all of the, the global transfers into a single stateful service so we can maintain idempotence. Um, and at the same time, the ledger, the double entry service, is observing those events and updating the debits and credits. So we have an up-to-date analytical view in real time. Um, at that point, if this is to another Nubank customer, um, that's internal, right? We'll just route that into the right, sh right shard and complete the, and complete the transaction. Um, but an interesting feature of, of Brazil is that even if it's to an external bank account, to any other bank account in the entire country, that's also fine. And it's also in real time. So we can basically translate Kafka messages into a SOAP approach and back and forth and get that into a centralized hub and spoke payments model for Brazil that is connected to hundreds of other Brazilian banks that, that we didn't have to integrate with one by one, uh, thankfully. Um, and so I, I find this really interesting kind of as an American coming from the ACH system. I mean, this is pretty much space age technology. And it's, it's kind of born out of a, a legacy of high inflation rates in Brazil. People didn't want to wait until the end of the month to kind of build up counterparty risk and then, and then net settle, right? Even if that's easier on the systems, the value is placed on real-time gross settlement right now. And so this system does over a trillion HAIs, or about $300 billion uh, transferred around per day. Um, and everybody connected to this has IBM MQ series hardware, and it's all quite sophisticated. Uh, you can read more about it at this link. Um, so I think the, the overall 
kind of big picture summary is that the financial domain is large. There's a lot of pieces you need to have an, an MVP, a minimum viable product when you're dealing with people's money tends to not look so minimal. It tends to be, be large. And there's also a lot of interactions between the different kind of bounded contexts, right? You put something in chargeback um, and somehow that affects whether you're authorizing a purchase or not. And so these things tend to get highly coupled when placed inside a mainframe and when you allow database interconnections and stored procedures to, to kind of couple them together. So we had to work very hard to, to decouple them and we generally use Kafka and, and asynchronous messaging as the, as the lifeblood underlying that. Um, so I think, yeah, we're hiring in Sao Paulo and, and Berlin. Um, and thank you. I think we're now going to open up for, for questions. Can you help run the mic around to right up front? When you talk about the uh, um, authorizer components, when you pull out the messages from the Kafka streams, then how would you return that respond back to the client that this is the R code? Or, because Kafka is just one way, right? How would so for our authorizer services, they also can produce messages to Kafka. Um, do you know if this one is HTTP or Kafka when a new transaction comes in? Right, it's all Kafka. So yeah, so for us, Kafka is both ways. We use Kafka to synchronize state into the authorizer so we know you're open to buy in real time so we can respond immediately if you try to transact. But then we push that state back out into the cloud and also back out, importantly, into all the other authorizer instances, right? So that they all get an updated version of your open to buy. Otherwise, you risk you know, speed attacks and things where if, if something's routed to an, a, a stale authorizer, you could spend the same money twice, right? That's the critical, the double spend problem is, is the critical thing that we have to avoid as a... Uh... Yeah, we, we use Kafka, so Kafka has asynchronous semantics, but it basically operates in real time for us. So we think of it as almost synchronous. We don't think of it as something that's gonna take a long time. It's, we think of it in real time, even though it's technically asynchronous. And it only, it only becomes obviously asynchronous when lags build up in response to some kind of issue. Yeah, we actively monitor queue lags and we ensure that uh, in regular operation, most of the time, all queues are, have a zero lag. Uh, first of all, I think uh, the architecture uh, probably uh, like uh, the reason being uh, so many decoupled parts. Um, but I, I would like to understand uh, like from uh, using Kafka, right? So uh, were you actually uh, doing any kind of uh, aggregations uh, in Kafka or um, because uh, I think the Kafka is an interesting choice, right? Because you have a chance of du uh, duplications, right? And um, I mean, uh, they we talk about exactly one semantics, but uh, end of the day, it's, it's really hard, right? I mean, with so many events messages coming in. Um, so how do you do that? Maybe a little bit on that. And I mean, with so many moving parts, so many decoupled parts, uh, how difficult was it uh, in general to, uh, I think, uh, what was your road to that complete architecture and how difficult was it to just not do it, but convince everyone around it that it's going to work? That's a great question. So we don't rely on Kafka exactly one semantics for our business. We actually make sure that any message that goes on Kafka is idempotent. They have to be idempotent because you could consume the same message more than once. Um, so what we use is datomic transactional semantics to maintain that, right? So when you consume a message, uh, we have a correlation ID or, or something in that message to know if we've already seen it before. And if that uh, goes into the database, we use transaction functions to make sure that we don't, we don't you know, ha have something that is is double double counted, right? Even in the presence of of multiple messages. So we use acid transactions for that. We don't use the stateful uh, kind of Kafka streams or or exactly one semantics. Is it uh, real time or do you do like a uh, Lambda architecture? So it is real time for everything that involves the operation. We do a, a bit of a Lambda architecture for things like machine learning models, whereby. We, we run a really expensive model overnight to pre-compute something, and then we merge that in so that if you were to ask you know, for a credit limit increase, we could respond in real time, even though we pre-computed it in the batch environment last night. So we do a little bit of merging, but, but not much. Um, 
and it's it's an interesting point. Like, how did we end up with this decoupled model? Where are, are we kind of heroes? Did we are we really smart? Not not really. So we we actually built a, a massive service. This is still infamous in NewBank called Accounts, and it had like everything in there. And then we we spent I don't know six months um, splitting that. So so no, we definitely got the bounded context wrong, and we definitely were tempted because these things interact, right? Why not put them in the the same database? It's very tempting. So. We had to split services, and, and in, especially with Datomic, it's not very fun. You end up doing log replays, and, and it's, a tough, it's a tough thing. You know, that said, it's very clear that we need to get to massive scale. Otherwise, we won't be a successful commercial retail bank, right? So um, it's easy to justify those sorts of investments when you have a long-term vision for where you need to get to. It, it, you know, cutting the corner doesn't really make sense in our context. Hi. Uh, I would actually have a couple of questions. Uh, so the first one would be uh, choosing uh, somehow an extraordinary stack. Uh, would you have some uh, hindsight, hindsights about that or what would you change if you would have um, an opportunity uh, to change it? Also, would you change anything about the architecture? Uh, yeah, I have one big thing I would like to change if I could, in, uh, if I could have thought of it in the beginning, is that um, one interesting uh, feature of Datomic that we have, haven't mentioned yet is that transactions in Datomic are a first class concept. So you can attach metadata to transactions. And we do that. We attach the, the, the version, the Git version of the service, we attach the credentials of the user that, that is making that, that transaction, and several other things. Uh, one thing that we do not add and I would, would have liked to add is uh, a customer identifier. Because if every single transaction had an, an identi identifier that could point to the actual customer that owns that data, uh, things like splitting databases for sharding would have been much, much easier. I think that, that, that's a small detail, but it's something I would, I would have liked to, to get better in the beginning. I, I think we also made some mistakes with how we use Datomic. So Datomic is really good for high value business data. It doesn't work that well for firehose rights or really long strings or, or, or things where you want to be using different sorts of data stores. So sometimes we overuse Datomic as kind of like the default database for everything. And you can kind of get lulled into this, the false sense of security is, oh, I'll just start a service with Datomic when the answer should be S3 or Dynamo or you know something else. So I think it's slightly overused. But no, no major um, regrets. I think one thing that I would do differently if I could do it over again is think about event sourcing a little bit earlier because I think we, we have event sourcing downstream from Datomic, but not upstream. So we don't get to see you know, every request and every event that happens before the database write um, are, are events that are effectively lost. So I think that's something I would have thought harder about and, and maybe treated Kafka as a persistent uh, thing versus a, a more of an ephemeral message queue um, earlier. Um, okay, another one. Um, so I guess uh, debugging hundreds of microservices sounds like a lot of fun, especially when you have uh, customers complaining they didn't receive uh, any money, things like that. Um, so how are you attacking that problem? I guess you're using some kind of uh, distributed tracer or things like that. Yeah, it's, it's surprising how non-patient people can be when you know they don't they don't see their their money. Um, it's, it's not a very forgiving domain. So we, we don't use anything like Zipkin yet. I, I think distributed tracing is interesting, but what, what we do is um, Splunk, right? So we use Splunk and we use a, a concept of a correlation ID whereby every service that consumes or makes an HTTP request or produces appends a segment, a random segment to that CID. So it behaves like a tree, right? So for any given request, you can look at a CID and then shorten that to figure out the entire fan out of events on HTTP and Kafka that happen in the whole system. So does that make it enjoyable and, and easy? Not really, but it's definitely tractable. You can always establish kind of what happened and, and, and why. Yeah, a related comment is that uh, we use that, that feature of appending metadata to the atomic transactions to store that correlation ID as well. So we can, can have tools that, that correlate log uh, aggregation uh, data with the actual uh, database, uh, what happened in the database at that moment. Uh, 
So uh, it's, it's much easier to debug than if you have a, a, a system that can lose data where you don't know the history of what happened. So this has been very helpful for us. Okay, unfortunately, I think we're at time. So let's thank our speakers one more time.